up. Welcome to the panelists and all the participants. I'm Kim Knoyer. I'm an information security engineer at Ocean. I've been working at Ocean for just over six years. I've been in the technology field for, oh, probably over 25. Um, it's been an interesting journey, and I'm very excited to hear from our panelists. And I will let them introduce themselves. Francesca, if we could start with you, tell us a little about yourself, please. Good morning. First of all, let me thank you, Nimoda and David, for putting on this incredibly important panel and so timely. So, and thank you for having me again. Um, I, I am currently, I wear multiple hats. Uh, one of them is as a senior fellow for cyber leadership at the Pell Center on the beautiful campus of South Virginia University. Um, there, my work is focused on studying, researching, and writing about issues there at the intersection of policy, technology, law, governance, international affairs. Um, a lot of our events and publication are aimed at raising awareness among our leaders about the cyber threats facing society um, and leaders in the digital age. I'm also an adjunct professor at South Virginia University where I teach cybersecurity in the MBA program. And I'm also a cybersecurity consultant at Hathaway Global Strategies, which is a small niche consulting firm um, that you know, advise clients both in the public and private sector on emerging technology, global cybersecurity trends, cyber-related policy, laws, regulation. Uh, so I guess I'll be your less non-technical um, expert on the panel. <laughs> and thank you again for having me. Thank you. Suzanne. Hi, everybody. Thanks for letting me come here and talk a little bit about my, my journey. Um, Dave mentioned submarines. Well, I started out as a software engineer programming submarines. Um, that was one of my first jobs that I had. And at the time, women weren't allowed on the subs, so uh, we, I couldn't actually go out on any of the tests. Um, but I was one of the programmers for, um, for the um, submarines. And then I, I also worked on the Missile Warning Center in Cheyenne Mountain, um, it's, which is part of NORAD, where we actually programmed our own protocol stack. This is before TCP IP. And we actually wrote our own path, packet sniffer before Wireshark. And we used to test all our message traffic uh, with our own, you know, stuff that we built ourselves. And then I was a Unix kernel engineer for a while where I worked at a hardware manufacturer and we had to port Unix um, to hardware. So I became uh, really uh, well versed in Unix, which has served me well now with Linux. Uh, but it, after a while, I jumped over to product management, which, which I, I, I got to say that you don't have to stay in software if you don't like software. And I became a product manager for a product called SoftSwitch. This was in the dot-com boom. And so we were taking all the traffic off the uh, phone networks and we were putting it on the internet. And so my job was, was no longer writing code. I was, I was leading a team. I was coordinating with engineering and marketing and manufacturing and training and customer service and customers and everybody to get a roadmap together for the product. And I got to travel all around the world, um, Europe and Asia, listening to customers, which was really a, a fantastic job. Um, and at one point I worked for three different companies and stayed in the same office because <laughs> everybody was buying things, buying different companies. Um, but, but I decided eventually to go back to school and get my PhD. And now I'm a professor at Rhode Island College and I'm building a cybersecurity program at RIC right now. And I'm, um, I'm using all the lessons that I've learned throughout my career to um, build this program. And I work with the NSA on what's called the Gen Cyber Program. And I need to talk to you high school students about this because it's free camp in the summer for you to learn cybersecurity. Thank you, Suzanne. And Mary. Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to meet all of you. And uh, Suzanne, that it's kind of hard to follow you. <laughs> right, it's not fun to follow you right after you're so amazing and Francesco same with you. Um, so um, I'm Mary Sharif, I'm a technical security architect at Cisco and uh, my background is hodgepodge, it's everything. I have done very, very, uh, I've been in different market segments uh, in banking and telecommunications um, I have done um, consulting. I have been director of compliance for the state of New York. And so I bring in different aspects to my job in terms of the policy, the technology, the 
sales background. So when, you know, David was talking about uh, having different dimensions, having different experiences that you can bring into your job, every single experience that you have brings something unique to your position. And I think that, uh, you know, this is the most fun job I've ever had. Uh, cybersecurity is a phenomenal field to be in. If you like change and you like to be challenged and you want to be rewarded equally, uh, then this is the field to be in. So uh, thank you for having me on this panel this morning. Well, thank you all for sharing your stories. They are all amazing. Uh, part of the discussion today will be about diversity. And I think we've already heard there are so many different paths to where we've ended up in the field of cybersecurity. Um, it's, it's a journey and can be a lot of fun uh, getting there. So just to start this discussion off, um, what made you decide to pursue cybersecurity? And what would you say to encourage women um, and, and maybe other minorities as well to join or to pursue a career in cybersecurity? And Francesca, if we could start with you. Sure. So I probably have the more unusual background. I've been fortunate enough to have a great career so far, but um, most of it was unexpected and unplanned, at least at first. Unlike many of the students on this uh, panel and some of my students, there were no programs in cyberspace policy or management of cyber risk, the things that I'm more interested in on when I was in college. I actually um, started my studies and my you know, career thinking I would be a diplomat and cybersecurity was definitely not part of that equation. I was always drawn to science and technology and how to solve complex problems. So for all of you on the call that, again, don't necessarily want to pursue a um, computer science degree, an engineer degree, there is a place for you in cybersecurity. My interest was more in the tech, kind of technology that makes our everyday life easier. But um, also because I wanted to be a diplomat and pursued you know, studies in international affairs, international laws, I studied and worked in multiple countries around the world. Um, during many of my courses and classes, experiences, modeling the United Nations, you know, it's like capture the flag or cybersecurity war games. It's during actually those experiences that I started learning about the strategic multi-dimensional power struggles that were already brewing, you know, we're talking about 15 years ago or more among countries and the way that especially those cyber powers, you know, Russia, China, the United States were already using cyber tools and capabilities to project power, influence global politics, impose their own interest, conduct cyber operation through and in cyber space. And so those are the topics, the issues that got me really interested in this field. Um, you know, at the time, when, uh, we also saw the first so-called conflict in cyberspace in Estonia, in the country of Georgia, in the late 2000. And so I knew that cybersecurity was not just an IT problem best left to the IT department, but it was also a national security problem, a legal, a regulatory problem, a business operation problem, a human psychology problem. And I knew that technology and the internet would be shaping geopolitics and security issues for the foreseeable um, future. So unlike, again, many of the people in this field, those those were the issues that got me interested in the cybersecurity uh, field. Um, but also what continues to fascinate me is the wide spectrum of fields that one can pursue without ever leaving the sector. You can be in cryptography and mathematics in computer science, in international law and security like me, legal compliance and regulation. All of this still within the cybersecurity um, sectors. And I'm sure we'll touch more on, but because we have such a shortage of cybersecurity professionals, we, there is no way to close the gap between the demand of professional and the supply without including more women and, and people with diverse background um, in the field. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne. So um, cybersecurity is, is really fun. Um, it, you need to have like an adversarial mindset. I like to think of this three, three different things that you really need to think about. You need book smarts, of course, the analytical, but you also need to be creative and use your imagination. Uh, and you also need like the practical, you need street smarts as well. Um, so it's, it's a fun path, it's, it's puzzle solving. Um, but of course, we need more people in cybersecurity in general. 
but do you know we're actually building bias into products unconsciously? Like for example, facial recognition software does not recognize black and brown faces as well as white faces. And uh, it's because they're not doing testing correctly, right? They're not testing on a wide variety of skin types. The spacesuit wasn't originally developed for a woman. I mean, you could just think about what that means, you know, and there, we're actually building our world without all the diverse, you know, our cyber world with all, all the d diverse opinions that we need. So it's really important that everybody joins in and, and be part of this, um, just cybersecurity and STEM as well. And I'm gonna put a couple articles that you can look at of what I was talking about in the um, chat. Thank you, and Mary. So for me, joining cybersecurity, as I said, I have worked in multiple different market segments. For me, it was um, in the market, I saw that there was a big gap uh, between what the IT technologists were implementing versus what the business needs were. And that continues to be an issue, right? The business wants to run at the best profit margins, have great differentiators uh, amongst their competitors, they want to have uh, credibility in the market from the sense of they don't want to be breached, right? They want to have the right security portfolio uh, so that they, they're not a Swiss cheese, right? The Swiss cheese to me is um, you have these gaps, you, you implement security, but you, you have these gaps and these gaps are like Swiss cheese, they're holes in your uh, environment, right? And then if it's really aligned well, adversaries are going to get in and they are going to exploit. And oftentimes, IT gets a budget, IT gets direction from a custodial perspective. Of these are the things that business wants you to do. They go off and they do it, but they cannot come back and speak to the residual risk that the owners need to understand and you know, um, be mindful of what to accept, what are exactly they accepting. Or oftentimes, IT goes and implements security without knowing what the business requirements are. And there are so many different um, aspects to requirements, right? There is the regulatory requirements that friend uh, Jessica was talking about. There is the compliance piece, right? Those are all the compliance pieces, the regulatory. There is the legal ones, right? Things that you have signed uh, with other organizations uh, that you can comply with. You have contracts, you know, with other vendors or with, you know, perhaps um, other universities or the government or whatever it may be. And then business requirements, if you cannot meet the core competency of your business and IT does not become an enabler for the business, then that's really not where we need to be, right? Then we're making wrong investments with the wrong, with not even achieving half the outcomes that we need. So I felt as somebody who, uh, even though English is my fourth language, I think that I can articulate uh, the requirements of the business uh, to the IT folks, and I have a technical background, so I can take the technical, uh, you know, requirements from my perspective, perhaps as a custodian, uh, and translate it back to the business owners. And I thought this was a niche thing to have, and um, that was before I joined Cisco. And once I joined Cisco, this whole technical perspective changed a lot when I became a system engineer in Cisco. That's when you got to know really, really need to be technical. And so it took that to a whole different level for me. And for me, being a minority, right? It, it doesn't take a lot to know that I'm a minority, right? My skin color is different. I have a different accent. So I am as diverse as diverse can get. So, have, you know, being on my team today, I can tell you, I bring a lot of value to my organization because of the, of the differences I have. And I think the different mindset, the different education, working in different fields. So I would say for every one of you, think about one thing. If this field interests you, there should be nothing else that stops you from joining it. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, that's actually a great segue um, into the next question that we have. And I think, I'm going maybe change this question a little about um, what would you consider the building blocks that were that would be instrumental for someone's success in this field, and especially for the students on this call, 
maybe a little discussion around the soft skills that are so helpful in any career path, but especially as Mary just mentioned about her ability to be technical, but also communicate the business needs, um, you know, in ways that it may get the students thinking about, um, it's not all about the books and knowing the answers, but what other um, skills can we bring in to help advance um, in this, in any career path, but especially in cybersecurity with mentors and, and, um, and things like that. So I would like to start with um, Suzanne on that question, please. Okay, great. So um, let me just start with this, the part about seeking out mentors. That's really important. Um, you don't even have to have a relationship with somebody to have somebody as an ex, a mentor. They don't even have to know that they're your, you know, that um, they're a mentor of yours. If you find somebody that you respect, a teacher, another student, maybe they get, you know, like you really uh, admire them, look at what they're doing. Like what makes them that kind of a person that you respect? You know, um, it could be anybody. It could be a local leader. Um, what is working for them? How can you improve? How can you, how can you be more like them? Uh, what mistakes do they make? So you can learn, you know, you're not going to make those mistakes. I mean, you can learn a lot from people that you don't even know. Um, a positive attitude is really really important there's a lot of failure in this kind of a job where you know especially technology you have to try a lot of things before you get to a successful thing so um you know like if you if you're not feeling well about something can you change your perspective maybe um look at yeah i mean it always i mean commu communication skills are really important so whatever you can do uh, as far as writing skills start to write formal letters, you know, com communication skills, don't start doing presentations because these kind of skills are really gonna um, set you apart from other people when you start a job somewhere. Thank you, and Mary? Yes, yeah, so for me, I think always live with your strength and continue to self-develop. So for women especially, most of us suffer from imposter syndrome which is like, you're in a job, you're doing great, but of course we have to be perfect, right? Anything less than perfect means we're just failures, obviously, right? So just know one thing about this field. On a day-to-day -day basis, you're never going to know everything. You're just not going to. There is so much change, there is so much innovation, and there are just so many different variables that gets interjected that the only thing you can say for sure is that every day you come and you do your utmost best and surround your people, yourself with people that know more than you do, right? So get the right mentors. And yes, that's plural, right? So most people in this field have a specialization. And depending on your roadmap, you're going to need direction and support from, for different aspects of where, where you need to be because this is a multi-vector. Right, this is multi-variable type job. You're gonna need to know more than one thing or one aspect of something. So, but also be open to change your path. If something comes up and it interests you, you don't need to know the job 100%, but you do need to have a mindset like Susan said. You need to have the right attitude and that attitude is willingness and ability to learn and not be afraid to take on new things. And you know, it will come, be patient, and just know going like your bar, your baseline should be, I am not going to know everything in this field, but there are some things that I'm going to know better than others. And there are other people that will know something better than me and be okay with it. Thank you, Mary. And Francesca. I would just emphasize again, the importance of mentorship and trainership programs. I couldn't be where I am today without the incredible female mentors I had in my path. Um, I also, back to your point, Kim, I would encourage people to gain soft skills, which are very much needed. I, I know plenty of companies are recruiting and they often ask, yes, I can teach that person the technical um, skills they need on the job, but I need somebody who's able to also talk to the other employees in the company 
company to be, like Mary was saying, able to translate very technical issues into business term. What's the value at risk for my business? How will the bottom line be affected if we suffer a data breach? And those are skills that I learned previously through some of the experience that I mentioned, whether there were simulation, conferences, events, internship. That's where I learned most of my speaking, public speaking skills, writing skills, the way of you know thinking critically, solve complex problems, but also teamwork, leadership skills. And those are things the students on the call and people, even mid-level career, can learn through a variety of experience. Also, besides their college degree, I wouldn't dis uh, dis disregard that certification. Now, like back into like technical field, there's a lot of certification that are actually needed and required for specific job in the private sector. If you work as a contractor for the Department of Defense, if you want to work in the intelligence community. So I encourage you to start looking into those certifications if those are career path you want to uh, follow because it won't be just your college degree or your master's but some of the specific certification with their security plus net plus cssp um, and again there are other specific certification required to work um, for the government i've also been lucky enough to be able to pick my project thinking about the building blocks you were um, asking about uh, I, I having uh, the ability to pick and choose the things you want to work on, whether it's on an internship or your first job, volunteering mm. to be part of a team that works on something that you really care about and you want to learn can be incredibly valued. I've been invited to very high level conferences at the beginning just because I was a very, very good note taker. And because of that, I got an incredible network um, and people still call me up for the incredible skills I had in taking notes. I read every publication and every book I could so that when I was dismissed as being a woman or too young or having an accent I would be the best prepared person in the room so those are things that people at all ages can start doing now they don't have to wait to get their college degree thank you um, so the next question I'd like to ask what challenges or obstacles did you have in your career path or your journey and how did you overcome them Sorry, uh, Mary, could we start with you? Sure. So for challenges for me, having that diversity of background, just not having, um, you know, a, a, a heavy background in networking, for example, right? Uh, and I joined Cisco as a system engineer. That was very challenging. Um, it was a completely new language. I didn't have a background in it. Uh, the background I had was policy, right? Policy and uh, compliance, either though I had, you know, certain amount of certification to Francesca's point, uh, and they're incredibly valuable. Um, learning was, was the first and foremost thing I needed to focus on. And so as I worked through that challenge, I went and did the first thing that established is that, you know what, I did not come through the door with this uh, knowledge. But guess what? I have it now. I went and got a CCNA and routing and switch and certification, which means by, you know, by it's recognized that if you have this certification, you have a certain level of knowledge in this, in this um, environment. And so that was one of my challenges. The second was um, just knowing, understanding myself that this was the right career path for me. I'm very, very passionate about the compliance piece because I just love working with frameworks like NIST and ISO and, uh, you know, and uh, now CMMC, right, uh, that is required for DOD. So just going, uh, having that background and then translating it back uh, to customers who are not so well versed, right? In my role today, I have to talk security architecture with my customers. And most of them are not reverse. They don't have a dedicated security group. Um, and so that is also a challenge to overcome. And so sometimes you have to talk about um, their, their needs, but make it sound so that they know you're not talking down to them in terms of their security posture or the fact that they don't have dedicated folks. And so what you're saying may not really resonate. So it's not always just about challenges that you bring to the table, but it's also challenging from the other side to kind of negotiate and talk about and deal with. So you just keep on doing what you're doing, lead with your strengths, 
always be with your strengths and continue to learn. And I think you can overcome anything. Thank you. Francesca. So some of the uh, challenges I just mentioned, you know, I've been dismissed in the past uh, when I was too young or being a female in the field. This, in some of my initial studies were actually focusing on cyber education, both in civilian and military university. When I went to present one of my very first studies, and I don't know, I was like probably like 28, 29, um, to all the military academies um, were colleges, and I was probably the only woman in the room telling them all the things that they were not doing right to teach their future military officers about how to work in this field. Um, so that was interesting. Obviously, fortunately, I'm not shy um, and I've learned how to articulate my thoughts and you know, be prepared when I um, address a room. But I also learned to, um, I think, listen and take in all the advice and suggestions and recommendation that I could get from all the cybersecurity experts. As I told you, I would try to get invited into all the cybersecurity conferences and events I could. Also, you know, Mary touched upon a lot of really important issues and I want to be repetitive but um, I also want to encourage people to think that you don't have to choose between having a family having children and having a successful career I think it all stands to being organized um, I don't subscribe to the, the lean in and you can have it all uh, but you can you can try you can do all of those things and figure it out day by day Nimoda and I often talk about our challenges of continuing to pursue our careers and uh, taking care of young children at home, especially in this time. Um, and, and maybe it is um, fortunate that right now we can work from home and dedicate more time to our work and our family. So I, I just want everybody to know that you can indeed have a successful career, be ambitious, um, you know, surpass some of the challenges you will encounter during your career. And also if you want to have a, fam have a, have a successful family. Thank you, excellent point. And uh, Suzanne. So I'm a little shyer than, than Francesca, so I have to work a little harder at uh, communication. <laughs> so, you know, like um, uh, when I st first started speaking in public, I had to tell myself that, you know, I was a, a vehicle of communication and I, 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 I'm an actress, you know, like all these different things to psych myself up. So if you're worried about um, presentation skills and stuff like that, it comes eventually. But um, I, th I think that things, one of the biggest challenges that I, that I face is that things take a lot longer than you want them to take. So you have to have patience, you know, like I, I see this on a, a level with my students, like they always tell me they work, they work too long on something. Well, guess what? <laughs> you always have to work too long on something to get it to work. Um, so I always tell, you know, I think that having a long, you know, like if, if you get frustrated because something's not going your way, um, to have long-term goals and to have short-term goals and to write them down every day and, you know, work on, if you have a long-term goal that you can't seem to get to, do something every day whether it's reading an article, um, calling somebody, you know, it could be very small, but just write down every day, do something towards your long-term goal, and that will make you feel better about being frustrated that you can't, you know, you can't get faster to your goals. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about diversity and its importance, and I, I think one of the things that I'd just like to comment on, at Ocean, we have a tagline, hashtag stronger together. And it has proven over and over to me um, that whenever we work together as a team or with our membership, with the community, uh, a better solution always seems to rise to the bubble to the top as we're taking in all these different um, experiences and, and information from others. So how important do you think diversity is? And you know, the, what value do you think it brings to uh, team, the teams that you work on or have worked on? And Suzanne, I'd like to start. Okay. Um, so first of all, there's all kinds of diversity. You know, there's, there's cultural, racial, religious, age, you know, sex and gender, disability, um, generational, like for example, my mother, Thing, she's been sending me a Halloween card every single year since out of college. And she just asked me the other day why I never sent her one. <laughs> it's like, 
what? You know, like, I didn't know that was a thing, you know? <laughs> so, you know, like our, my students send email. Uh, I, I, I mean, I send email, they don't, they don't listen to email. Like there's, there's all kinds of diversity. And that's just like an example of generational. But if you think of three people with the same exact background working on the prob a problem, they're gonna come up with the same exact solutions probably or very similar solutions. So um, diversity fosters uh, innovation, inspires creativity. It opens a lot of new pathways that you might not even think about, you know, like meeting new people. Um, even like if you think about like marketing, um, it, it opens recruitment op opportunities. You might not know how to reach a group of people, but then you, you know more people in that group. So, I mean, it's just, it, it's just, it opens up everything. I mean, I think it's just important for innovation, creativity, everything to, to come up with solutions. Thank you. Francesca. Well, I certainly agree with Suzanne that we cannot solve this very complex problem we're trying to address if we don't have a diversity of backgrounds, education, way of thinking, um, way to solve those problems. But and again, the pro uh, point I made earlier today is that we have this widening gap between the, sh the, 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 the demand for cybersecurity professional and the supply. We don't have enough people. There are currently over 500 thousand open jobs just in the United States. There are over four million around the world in cybersecurity. There is zero unemployment, even in this time of economic and you know health crisis. And there is no way that we can close that gap to equilibrium without more women and minorities. Um, so this is the time to enter this profitable and, and you know, very rewarding field. Also, just to back about having more women, we actually represent 47%, 48%, I think, of the global workforce, but they're only about 20% in the cybersecurity field. And the US is better than other countries. Like, I, I'm, you know, when I go home back to Italy, um, I'm still dismissed as, what are you doing in this field? I don't even know how to explain to my parents what I do because I'm not a traditional computer scientist or engineer or expert. So again, women, minorities, diversity it is the key to solving both the, the workforce shortage skills, but also how we solve complex issues and start thinking in a more strategic, holistic way. Thank you. Mary. When I think of diversity, I think of any project, anything that you create or that you're building. To Susan's point before, um, you know, the visual recognition technologies have bias built into them. Why do you think there is, that, that, that exists, right? Because there was not enough representation or, or data points going into that project. There was not enough negative uh, testing, right, to ensure there was no bias built into that. And when you have different mindsets that think of a single problem, that's where you come up with best practice. Best practice to me is the end result of looking at something and like going and doing everything you can to, to uh, negatively rip it apart and then you put it back in, right? So if you have a project and all you're thinking is for for positive outcomes and for positive testing and a one mindset, it's vanilla. It's nothing more than, oh yeah, we have something great, but put it to test and it's gonna be filled with bugs and issues. Same thing in an organization. You just bring one, somebody with the same kind of background, right, have all engineers work on something. Like the, the very reason that the United States as a, as a country comes with so much innovation is because we have so many people that graduate with our degrees. And then they are like, well, there's not enough money in this, so maybe I should do something different. And then they get into a different field. And all of a sudden you have, you know, these people that try, they have that background, they have that creativity. And you bring in science and creativity and you're gonna end up with something phenomenal, right? And that's why, because you bring that you bring in the diversity but you need hardcore engineers to think about those things that are really siloed and focused and so when you bring in the art piece from someone you bring the innovation piece from somebody else you bring in the tactical uh, capabilities the communication pieces the person that's always negative that says you know nothing can ever be done properly you need some of those people in your team if you're building something and so diversity to me helps organization come up with best practices, best business solutions, 
and biz and uh, you know and product for the customers, and it's fun. Thank you. So I'm just going to put a little plug in here um, for anybody, but I'm going to target the students that are on this call. Please put your questions in the chat if you have any questions for the panelists. We'd love to um, engage some of your thoughts and perhaps answer some questions that you may have about entering this field. Um, so while the students hopefully are doing that, I have a question about, you know, how have you seen the industry change in the last few years and where do you think <laughs> this it's a projection. We don't have crystal balls, but where do you think it's the direction it's moving in in the foreseeable future? Um, and what skills do you think these students or, or anybody entering this field would need to have to um, work in this uh, cybersecurity field? And Francesca, could we start with you? Sure. I would just say, because I've been following actually the development of career path within the cybersecurity field. And when I wrote my first study about like eight years ago, one of the main issues that I uncovered and talked about was the lack of clear career path within cybersecurity. And that until we created clear career path with a progression, it was hard for people to imagine themselves having a career in this field and progressing. I mean, perhaps eight years ago, there were already, you know, a pen tester, uh, you know, software developer, um, but for us, there's so many now jobs within the cybersecurity field. So I think we've made some improvement in developing those career paths. I think there is still confusion about all the different degrees and certifications that are available out there. There is no, who certifies the certifiers? I always wonder. Who decides that CompTIA or SANS, and they're going to come after me, decides what kind of certification you need or should have. Um, so I think we still need to make some progress and if you think of the medical field or the legal field there is a board that decides what schools should teach in order to be able to get a medical degree a legal degree we don't have that in cybersecurity one argument is that the field moves so fast that it's hard to you know have firm um you know sets i disagree with that because i think the hardware and the software doesn't change we're just innovating on top of it um and also creating more issues and problems that we will need to study so so again, I see some progress compared to when I started looking at these issues eight years ago. I think more needs to be done. Um, as for what students should do, as I was saying earlier, not everybody needs to be a computer scientist or an engineer. Um, you can study um, humanities and arts and still have a place in this field. We need graphic designer. We need people to understand how to write a brochure, a pamphlet that teaches about cybersecurity. We are in Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So how do we, for example, within our company, um, try to encourage people to be better cyber aware, to have better cyber hygiene? That we need people with communication skills and know how to design a compelling vignette. Um, so there are really so many different career path and jobs within the cybersecurity sector that require creativity, arts, uh, dynamic way of thinking, uh, public speaking, writing skills. I, again, cannot em em emphasize enough the importance of having internship. You might actually do an internship and hate it, and then you'll realize that that's not what you want to do or that's not the company you want to work for. Um, there are opportunities even for high school and college students actually in Rhode Island. I'd be happy to share this information later on. A lot of the universities already have relationships with companies that take in those students for summer internship and many of those students are often offered a job afterwards. So start looking at those opportunities already within Rhode Island uh, to work with companies to shadow an expert or um, use it as a mentor. Again, look at certification in addition to your college um, training. There are a lot of tools and opportunities. There are free camps. There are a lot of resources online. Be careful, obviously, with scams. But there is a lot in this field. It's hard to navigate sometimes. I'm, I'm available and I know my fellow speakers would be too if people want to follow up and have questions and need additional guidance. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne. Well, speaking as someone who's trying to build a cybersecurity program at a college, I mean, I totally agree with Francesca. I mean, you can look at all the universities and all the colleges across the country, and you're going to find um, different ways to have a, a major or a minor. So um, what I'm doing right now is, is I'm, I'm following the guidelines of the NSA 
um, for their Certificate of a um, Academic Ex Excellence Program um, using the ACM curricular guidelines, which is the um, academic computer machinery. It's the computer science um, uh, main uh, group of people. And I'm also listening to local leaders, you know, what, who, who, what do people want? Who, who are they going to hire, you know, to get jobs, at, especially Rhode Island College. A lot of my students stay in Rhode Island, which is great. So I can look to the local leaders and find out, you know, what they need. And what I'm hearing, I'm mean, just throw out some computer science-y skills. <laughs> I'm hearing learn Kali Linux, learn how to script, you know, practice with um, capture the flags. Make sure you know cybersecurity awareness, just to name a few things that I'm teaching in, in my classes. Thank you. And Mary? So, so I think Francesca and Suzanne really touched on great points about the academic you know, side of it and from a programmatic uh, vision of, of where the field is going. For me, I think that COVID has changed a lot, right, from a practitioner's um, point of view. Uh, where most companies were really not open to cloud as much as they could have been, all of a sudden everybody's rushing to the cloud, right? This is this is the way to go. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of transition of companies and organizations that is going to be looking at a cloud strategy if they don't already have one. And so that is going to create a lot of demand for people who are cloud certified and have knowledge of the cloud and how to transition these companies over to the cloud. Uh, a very important thing to really know foundational for security, well, regardless of how security changed to Francesca's uh, point, there are some things that are foundational, right? Software, hardware, these things are foundational. Same thing in cybersecurity, frameworks are foundational. You need to know about NIST. You need to know ISO uh, controls you need to know how to look at an organization, take their requirements and translate it to an overlay of certain controls from these frameworks to know what they need to implement. So these are foundational. This is not gonna change regardless of who you are. You cannot just come, it's, it's like studying for a degree without knowing which courses need to go into and what topics need to go to and what you're gonna be tested against. That's the way I look at it. If you don't follow a framework, you're not going to have those, those aspects of it. And focusing on just a job being a pen tester or being a software developer or whatever, that is great. Just have a basic baseline of what you need to know about security. And I think the other aspect with the cloud, we're gonna see a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunities with uh, you know coding and development right Pro programming a lot of devops secops these jobs where you write apis because forever companies invest in a gazillion different solutions they don't have the expertise to integrate it they do not get synergy amongst these different solutions and so they're going to have to work towards that they're going to have to work towards integrating uh, where these solutions talk to one another and you cannot really, as a good conscious um, organization, take your information to the cloud without first securing it. Because regardless of how secure the cloud provider may be, the onus of security for your data is on you and you can never ever transfer that. And so those, that's why I say know the frameworks and understand how to apply it uh, to a company because that is never gonna go away and we will definitely see an uptake in, in cloud solution, and I think that's where the, it's going. So Kim, I just wanted to quickly ask um, a quick question because I know some of the students will be dismissed uh, for lunch, so I wanted to get one of the questions in before, um, before they have to log off, but it looks like um, Christian had asked, uh, what was one of the most difficult missions you've had, and what was your biggest achievement? So. Um, Mary, if you wanted to um, I think about that. The biggest mission and what was my biggest challenge? The most difficult mission and your biggest achievement. I think this sounds silly, but my biggest challenge was the CISSP exam. If you have not taken it, it's a six hour exam that is behavioral based and it kicks high knees. 
Um, so you're going to have to be really, really prepared. And I always had a track record of passing everything at the first try. And I did pass my CIFSP at the first try, but I will tell you, I spent 14 hour days studying for it for good two months. Wow. Uh, and, and that was because I didn't, at that time, I did not have a solid background. I had five years of experience in security, but it was not as focused as all the different modules. You will always find when you go and study for, for uh, CIFSP that some modules you have more competency in than others. And it's because it's so fluid in the way the answers are. Um, there's always two best answers. And there is one that is better than the other. And so to me, that was uh, one of, and, the, and Cisco CCNA, that was the other one. Uh, it's behavioral based. So if you get one question wrong, they kind of pound you with the same things to make sure, do you really know it or did you make a mistake? So <laughs> I think those are the two most challenging um, times in my career in terms of building the credentials. Awesome. Uh, Francesca, your most difficult yep. mission or challenge and what was your biggest achievement? I think that my most difficult missions, not just one, is when I had to turn my research and the things that I thought into real outcomes. Um, in Rhode Island, for example, was changing the Rhode Island identity theft law in 2015. And when I brought it up to the attention of our lawmakers, that that law was outdated and I had done all of this research, I knew all of the other states, what they had done for data breach notification laws and what was the best laws, but we had to actually make real changes to the law that was extremely difficult. And so the same thing has happened. Every time I had to use my research and my you know, policy argument to affect real change. Like right now, I mean, um, I can't say too much about it, but um, one of our biggest clients is TikTok. And you're all uh, aware of what they're going through. So advising them on how to go through the CFIUS process in the United States and how to be compliant with data breach notification, data policy, privacy, data protection, cybersecurity, online child protection around the world means affecting real change into their policy, into their strategy, their filter, and so that is extremely difficult because, again, you need to translate uh, very technical issues sometimes into practical business terms, but it also has to fit within the strategy of a company. It's not just about cybersecurity. There are other competing interests. Um, as for my biggest achievement, it is obviously my child, and that's why I mentioned, again, you can have a successful career and also um, have a family if you want to. <laughs> I would say, especially when you're dealing with the people, lawmakers who know nothing about technology. <laughs> Yes, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. I have to say in Rhode Island, we are extremely lucky, at least at the um, congressional level and governor. Um, they do understand these issues. They have taken the time to understand at the local level, maybe not so much, but we were successful. Back in 2015, um, over 32 states proposed amendments to their data breach notification law, and I think only three passed, and Rhode Island was one of them. So it's awesome. Awesome. Um, and Suzanne, if you wanted to share. Um, sure. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, when I worked in the missile, when I, I was actually one of the people that installed the missile warning center in Cheyenne Mountain. And I got to tell you, there was nothing like going into that mountain um, to, with, to bring, bring software into that mountain and, and actually having to like take software down and bring software up and knowing that the missile warning center that that's what you're doing at that moment i mean that was incredible <laughs> it was the most scary thing uh, but it was i think it was the most rewarding thing as well because it was quite a task oh thank you okay so <laughs> uh, yeah i guess that's both the scary and the um, best experience <laughs> awesome thank you um, if anybody else had any questions in the audience, um, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you can ask or you can, if you're shy, you can certainly write it in and I'll read it for you. Um, but Kim, was there any, was there one more question you wanted to ask before? Yeah, I'd love to ask uh, one last question of the panelists. If you could go back, would you choose a different career path and why? And I'll start with Mary. So 
if I could go back, I would not choose a different career path than I have, but I would also not change what experiences I do have. Um, one thing I would say is I did not have the right, or actually a mentor at that time, when I started a family, um, I have a child that has, um, is on the spectrum that has Asperger's and my other uh, son has allergies and asthma. And so um, I, to me, my biggest job in the world was being a good mom and making sure that my boys were okay. And I have two, I raised, I, I basically put 150% focus on my two boys. And today, one is going for a PhD in physics, math, and computer sciences. That's what he's majoring in, and he's going for a PhD in physics. And the other one is at Hopkins going for, uh, he's going to be a brain surgeon someday. And they're both successful, they're both healthy, and they're good people. And so, um, if I had made a choice in technology, would I have been able to do that? I think so. Uh, but once again, this is a very, very challenging field. And what I did learn in my other, um, in my career and, and other market segments that I worked in, it really helped me with what I have today. So I would say just when you're making um, decisions on your career, just make sure you have, you're well informed before you make a decision. And, um, I will tell you, if you really get into this field, in every way you are going to love it if this is what, if this is your passion. Um, the, it's, and, and, you know, uh, quite honestly, in terms of financial reward, it's incredibly rewarding career to have. And you'll see that maybe if I had entered this a long time ago, I could have hired three people. But specialized, this is a specialization on raising children that maybe I didn't have. So who knows? But I have no regrets, and um, I would, I would right now would not think of doing anything else. I intend to retire in this field. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, I think that I, it's hard to know because I like like Mary was saying, I wouldn't want to not have the experiences that I had. But I think my teenage self, if I think about my teenage self, she really didn't know all the paths that were available to her. Right. I mean, I grew up in a time we didn't have internet access. We didn't have Google. We had guidance counselors. We had teachers. You know, there wasn't a lot to guide us. So I would, I would say, take advantage of, of all the research uh, that you can and really research different paths in careers because you have the technology today to really understand a career before you go into it. Um, I don't think I would, I, I think I would still choose the same path because I love math. I, you know, I, I've, I, I can't see myself doing anything else, but, but I would, I would, I would like to take, I would, I wish I had more opportunity to explore, you know, different paths and see what, if I would have chose this path. Thank you. And Francesca. So I also would not change anything and uh, would not change choose a different career path, but if I were to do it all again today with the opportunities available today at the university level, I probably would go to law school. Um, again, I think we need experts across the field and we do need more legal experts. So based on what is now available um, to law students um, that did not exist at my time, I certainly would probably add that to my educational background because I think we need more privacy lawyers, more compliance experts, but more general counsels, again, in companies understand how security fits into business and business into security. And we also need more diplomats, like I always wanted to do, um, and, and that understand now how to negotiate the norms of behavior for states in cyberspace, what should and should not be allowed in cyberspace for states to do, how international laws applies in cyberspace, what are the rules of engagement for future conflicts. So those are all things that now exist and we need experts on. And while I will continue to pursue them and be one of the self-taught people, um, there are certainly for people that come after me, actual degrees, internship and opportunities to learn uh, both on the books and in the field before you enter as a professional in the field. Well, thank you all very much. I'll also put in a little plug for, um, I'm the mother of three adult sons and uh, that was a huge focus. I stepped away from my career at one point and when I re-entered the workforce, um, you know, I, I found that I have had ample time to still cultivate a career 
and um, and I have three wonderful sons, and it, it all it all works out. <laughs> so, so Namota, I'll turn it over to you. I just want to thank the panelists and all the participants today. Yeah, thank you everyone so much for joining us this morning. This is uh, has been a, a great series that Ocean um, has hosted this month. This is probably one of my favorites. Uh, so thank you, you know, guys so much for, for participating. And I also wanted to plug, Suzanne, I know you have the summer program that you do in the summer. Um, so Mr. Frederick, if there's yes, an opportunity for your kids, um, for anyone who's interested in this, Suzanne runs this great program in the summer. Um, and I'd be happy to link you guys um, if there's any type of, of energy there. I think, I think it's a great opportunity. For, for kids. And Nimoda, if I may, um, just because it's happening tomorrow, we are having a panel discussion on election security. So it will be also about cybersecurity, but how we secure um, our election. We're only a few days from it. If you haven't made a plan, go vote. Um, but also if you want to share the information for that panel discussion, it might be really interesting for both students um, and any of you who want to participate and learn more about what actually states and local communities are doing to secure the integrity of our election. Awesome. Okay. So what, one more thing, you know, uh, we need networks, you know, in that field as well. And this is great that we can get together for that conference. That's a good thing because we can share, you know, something because for my student, for example, it's, it's good for them, you know, to see faces, people who are involved because, you know, they don't see any interest in why are we doing that. You know, it's like, this is not something that they really want to pursue. But when they see people like you, you know, who talk about, you know, the cybersecurity in that way, that's a good boost for them. And they may see themselves maybe down the road, you know, going to cybersecurity. But as well, I would need maybe uh, to have, you know, some names, uh, emails, maybe for a conference you know for the kids you know to interact with them that would be a good a good way for for me personally as a teacher to nurture them you know and encourage them to pick that uh that field so nickerson that's why i sent you that private note i uh i offer to uh come in and tell you a little bit about ocean uh yes. you know and and what we're doing you know here locally it is a, a fascinating network and i would be remiss if I didn't do a little bit of a plug, you know, for my, uh, not, not just for ocean, but, uh, for my women in technology, Very good. you know, that, that work here at ocean and Kim and, 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 and Katie doesn't have her, uh, doesn't have her, um, uh, video on right now, but, uh, to give you an idea of how robust the fields of interest that we're describing to you all, uh, are is ocean, even during COVID, actually hired people during COVID because of the needs for what you just said, Nick Nickerson, you know, we need networks mm -hmm. and we need security. Yep. And uh, Katie, uh, who's on the call today is a classic example of an intern who came to us uh, out of college and a cybersecurity uh, engineer. And, you know, we hired Katie on the spot. <laughs> And she's working on a brand new product for us mm -hmm. uh, to do automated penetration and, and vulnerability scanning, uh, you know, for the membership at Ocean, which includes Providence School System. So, um, so I, again, I want to do a real shout out to, to the women at Ocean, you know, for helping lead some of this. And, and our friends, you know, Francesca and Suzanne, and uh, it's just, just a, a great uh, crew. And, and, and by the way, uh, you know, we're, we're doing this part here in Rhode Island, uh, but in our field, the, the research and education network field, there are national uh, uh, initiatives uh, that involve women in technologies. In fact, there's a group called Women in Technologies uh, that we support nationally. One of our other engineers, Jackie, who we hired, uh, got a scholarship to go, uh, you know, into the Women in Technologies program for uh, a national organization that we're affiliated with. So there's a really robust, uh, you know, and, and long-term uh, need for diversity as was stated earlier. So I just wanted to thank our, our women for motion on this one. Thank you. Thanks, I just wanted to add one more thing. I know we're out of time, but this is uh, the Cisco Network Academy. 
um, yeah. offers free courses and networking for students. We also have great internship programs and we actually have a two year program. We will spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on our, on our um, you know, on, on people who actually get into that program and get you well rounded in the area of networking security and across our entire portfolio. So if you guys are interested, just an, an incredible offering. Definitely. Animal, I just want to tell you that you're free to share my contact information with any of the students or people on the panel. They either want to know more about um, college education, what Salve the Pell Center offers, my you know more unusual experience, any of that. I'm, I remain available. Me too, and I also have tons of college students that they could use as mentors as well. You know that I'm always awesome. trying to get my co my college students to reach out to high school students and. I, you know, I have them do interviews with people and stuff, so. So, so for mentoring, we work with the Tech Collective. Yep. Uh, so, Melo Stark, that name tells me something. I don't know if you, <laughs> <laughs> did, did you, did you stop by last year with uh, Chris Sturgeon to PCTA? Uh, Maybe, yes. Yeah. We, we, we visited you and we, we're, we work with the Tech Collective. Uh, and, and the P-Tech program. Yeah. Yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all coming back now. It's all coming back now. <laughs> Apparently. But I can definitely send out that information to you, Mr. Frederick. Thank you, Nimota. Um, Appreciate that. Thank you. Welcome. It was great. Very it welcome. was great. Okay. 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 <laughs> so thank, you. thank you, everyone. You know